Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburne, Editor-in-Chief. Steve Austin, Washington Editor. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. All right. On today's pod, we have the latest cuts of data from Intellia, another approval for Bluebird, and then we'll get into a few tasty bits from Washington. More on the implications of the Inflation Reduction Act. Today, we'll look at its impact or potential impact on orphan drug development. And CFIUS is back, and we'll explain what that means. When we get there, we'll also do a quick look at a new rarity in the biotech world, IPO. We had an IPO last week. But first, today's podcast is brought to you by the BioCentury Bay Helix East-West Biopharma Summit. It is scheduled for November 14th through 16th in beautiful Redwood City in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can visit BioCenturyEastWest.com and download the latest brochure with our preliminary agenda and schedule at a glance. All right, let's start with Intellia. A little more than a year after the company reported its breakthrough first clinical data that showed CRISPR-based gene editing may live up to its promise of creating one-time curative therapies for systemic diseases, the company has provided evidence for the second time that its platform can knock down a clinically relevant target in the liver, and it has showed the first evidence that it can deliver clinical benefit. Lauren, let's bring you in to discuss the implications here. Sure. So what we saw last week was the first data from the second program in Intellia's pipeline. And this second program is a lot like the first in that it's targeting the liver with a CRISPR-Cas9 therapy delivered with a lipid nanoparticle that's designed to knock down a target gene. So this program was for hereditary angioedema. And like the first time, um, like with the ATTR program, they've shown that they can achieve targeted knockdown of the gene. This, this time it's the KLKB1 gene in the liver greater than 90%. So I think this was expected, but I also think it's a good sign that this technology is good at doing exactly that targeted knockdown in the liver. What was new this time was also that they went one step further. HAA is an indication where you can quickly see an impact, a clinical benefit, which is not something that you can see on a short time frame for ATTR. So they found that in the three patients who were treated with the lower of the two doses tested, that by two of the patients were completely clear of HAE attacks after they were treated. And the third patient, it saw a reduction in the number of HAE attacks, it looks like almost immediately, but then by 10 weeks out, also had no incidents of HAE attacks for, for a couple of months after that. Lauren, I mean, obviously this is really, really exciting. It's important. We've been around from the birth of this new technology, CRISPR-based gene editing, and now to see it actually create functional differences is important. So I have a couple of questions. The first one, though, is, I mean, Intellia seems to just be doing this incredibly well. But we know that like a ton of companies in this space, even just for knockdown, I want to get to the other things in a minute. So do you think that Intellia has chosen better targets, is executionally better? Are they ahead of everybody? Or how, how should we think about that space competitively? So Intellia was the first of what we call the foundational CRISPR companies to go after an in vivo target as its lead program. Uh, is systemic in vivo target. So CRISPR Therapeutics is, is one of the other ones. They have a huge market value. They've done well. Uh, they went for the ex vivo applications first, where you're targeting stem cells or cancer cells and then putting them back from a patient and then putting them back into the body. Right, right. But let's be clear, Lauren, that, that I think that the in vivo hurdle is, is that bit bigger, right, in terms of what was unknown. And, and so I suppose in that way, I was thinking Intelia is kind of leading in vivo space. 
yeah, so Intellia just, I mean, strategically chose to go in vivo first, add it to the eye. And they also chose to go with the lipid nanoparticle delivery technology where um, they're delivering a ribonucleoprotein. So that has the Cas protein and the RNA for the guide. And so I think that's a delivery technology that has ended up working well for the in vivo applications of the technology. So they sort of, they were a bit of a pioneer in how to get this technology to the liver and they made what has apparently been a good choice in, in that delivery technology because it's this first type of application has gone well so far. So Lauren, just talk a little bit about the two different strategies. You've got knockdown or knockout, and then you've got insertion inside genes. And I know that Intellia is playing in both of those. How much do you think that advantage is going to help them in there? And maybe you can just explain the, the differences and the different risks in those two approaches to the technology. Yeah, I think that's going to be really interesting to see going forward, whether Intellia has also figured out a way to make gene insertions work. So the sort of early CRISPR technologies have been very efficient at knocking down genes. They just sort of have to cut a gene and the natural repair rec mechanisms are good at sort of messing up the sequence and decreasing expression of that gene. It's a lot harder with the initial CRISPR technology to insert a gene because you need to add a template and it relies on a type of DNA repair machinery that, that just isn't as efficient in a lot of cells. So I don't think we know exactly how efficient Intellia can be at that, especially when we're, we have an in vivo technology. And I think there's a risk because there are some newer CRISPR adjacent or gene editing adjacent technologies that potentially could be more effective at doing that. We, we also don't know yet because those have not been tested in the clinic either. So there are a lot of unknowns. And, and it's interesting, I think Intellia is trying to be the leader testing the limits of the technology, going into indications where, you know, it could make a huge difference if it, this works, but the competitive landscape is a little bit different for these knock-in or correction type applications because you've got the base editors and the prime editors and all the other editors that aren't actually cutting the DNA, but they're using different kinds of effectors to correct the sequence of genes. All right. And then, uh, well, we had Bluebird getting its second approval in as many months. Lauren, any quick takeaways there? I think this was expected. Um, I listened to the adcom in the spring, early summer. And, you know, we know that there's a cancer risk with the vector that's used in this program. Uh, there were some cases of MDS, and I think there's an AML risk as well. But this therapy is for CALD, where there's really nothing for patients who aren't eligible for, you know, a matched sibling transplant. Now, the price, uh, their first gene therapy approved by FDA was priced at $2.8 million. This one topped it. Right. So I think we have a $3 million price tag in the U.S. And Betty Cell had an outcomes-based pricing model that, that they were proposing. And in this case, given that it's an ultra-rare disease, um, it, there's no such model. So this will fall on the payers. Yeah. And uh, I know uh, the company said on its conference call uh, this morning that they're expecting a slow and steady launch from year end. And then a spokesperson told us that they don't believe an outcomes-based approach is appropriate in this indication, given the rarity and complexity is what they said that would just make it very, very challenging to implement. Well, hats off to Bloomberg. I know they, they had their struggles in Europe, but that's, that's two down in the US and we'll see how the launches go. All right, let's turn to... Washington, where Steve has continued to dig into the implications of the Inflation Reduction Act. Steve, last week you focused on therapies for orphan diseases. What did you learn? So I, I wrote about a provision in the law that hasn't gotten a lot of attention, at least not in the media, that exempts orphan drugs that are approved for only one rare disease or condition and no other diseases or condition from the price setting provisions of the IRA. The concern is that this is gonna lead companies to avoid developing additional orphan indications. This would be a concern for a drug with a single orphan indication that has the potential to generate enough sales 
to make it subject to price setting. So there's kind of a, a sweet spot that a drug would have to be in. But if a drug were in that spot, the company would be faced with a very difficult decision if there were the potential for developing a second orphan indication that would have, well, in, regardless of what revenues you get from the second indication, because you would potentially lose the ability to, to freely price the drug in perpetuity. Ted Love, the CEO of Global Blood Therapeutics, told me the issue could come up with the drug that his company is developing, Oxprida. That's GBT's sickle cell drug. It's approved only for sickle cell and orphan disease, and it's being studied as a treatment for acute lung injury and other indications. Revenues from those indications would be far less than for sickle cell, and they certainly wouldn't make up for whatever price discount the drug might be subject to if it's subject to the IRA's price setting provisions. Pfizer's acquiring GBT, and you know they may decide that, it, that they're better off dropping the additional indications rather than developing them. I think that decision is going to be based entirely on whether they think that the Medicare sales of Oxbride are going to be such that it's going to be potentially subject to price setting. I've heard from other CEOs and policy wonks at other companies who are very concerned about the single orphan exemption. They say it's going to disincentivize development of additional indications. Since the story was published, I heard from another biotech CEO who said, you know, basically that these concerns are overstated and, and that it's not going to have much impact. Steve, you know, you probably know as much about this and how things play out as, as anybody. So crystal ball here, Steve, how's this going to play out? Do you think there's going to be enough momentum to modify or fix the law in future sessions? Obviously, do you think it's going to end up chilling, you know, drug development in rare diseases? What's your sense telling you at the moment? So about the possibility of changing it? Yeah, I think there's a possibility of changing it. Look, the Orphan Drug Act itself, when it was passed, had provisions that limited the exclusivity and the tax benefits to drugs that were not profitable. And that made it a very unattractive, unattractive um, law for drug development. And it was changed. It was changed a couple of times before it became what it is today. Most laws that affect incentives for drug development have been modified over the years. Hatch-Waxman's been modified any number of times. So yeah, I think that there's a potential for modifying this one. If Congress is persuaded that, one, that it is going to chill orphan drug development, and two, that there's a way to modify it that won't kind of give carte blanche to, to drug companies to do what Congress, I think, believes is a, would be an abuse, which would be to get an orphan indication and um, use that to shield revenues from non-orphan indications. So what the Every Life Foundation is proposing, that's a, an advocacy group for rare disease R&D, what the Every Life Foundation is proposing is to change the law to say that drugs that only have orphan indications, regardless of how many orphan indications would be exempt from price setting. I'm not sure if that's really going to fly. The problem with that could be that a lot of drugs for cancer nowadays are orphan drugs, and it's possible to have a drug that's developed for multiple kinds of cancer where they're you know, very, very large revenues where potentially all of the indications could be orphan indications, and Congress might not be very happy about exempting all of those from the price setting provisions of the IRA, you know, we'll have to see how it plays out. All right, Steve. And uh, I know you're going to continue to dig into this subject. You've got your ear to the ground. If you want to dig deeper, chase down Steve's story on biocentry.com. Steve, you also spent some time on one of President Biden's executive orders last week. It was related to activities of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., also known as CFIUS. Now, we've been reporting on CFIUS for some time now. It is a source of some tension in cross-border circles. Steve, can you remind our listeners why it's important and then tell us what's new here? Well, CFIUS is important because it subjects foreign investment in the United States to regulatory scrutiny, including 
Sipius has the ability to either block a planned investment in a U.S. company or to make a U.S. company divest foreign investment if it believes that that investment threatens national security. The executive order that President Biden signed last Thursday is going to increase regulatory scrutiny on investments by foreign entities and U.S. companies that are important to national security. And it it makes it clear that national security is defined broadly. It mentions specific fields that are outside of the defense industry, including biotechnology and biomanufacturing. And it, it also says that CFIUS should sharpen its focus on patterns of investment as well as specific investment. And by that, what it really means is investments that in aggregate from a country could give a foreign country or foreign entities control over over an industry, influence over an industry, or the ability to reduce U.S. resilience, the resilience of the U.S. supply chains in ways that would be of concern. It doesn't mention any specific countries, but it's clear that this aspect of it anyway is really about China. All right. And just last week, we saw CFIUS axe a CDMO deal under which China's SimChem was going to buy Snapdragon Chemistry and delay another deal in Invox's buyout of F-Star. So a lot of CFIUS news last week. Again, we'll continue to follow this. What, one other thing that I should, should mention that, that's also relevant to that is that the law highlights aspects of the, of the CFIUS regulations that are intended to prevent foreign countries from gaining access to sensitive information about U.S. citizens, including health information, such as genomic information. So I think it's going to have an effect on the ability of companies from foreign countries, particularly China, to invest, for example, in CROs or genomics companies in the United States. All right. Now, we don't have time to dig into this this week. But last week felt pretty good for biotech financings. We saw a flurry of follow-on financings, and wait for it, the first sizable biotech IPO on NASDAQ in many moons. Third, Harmonic upsized its IPO, then raised a little more than $185 million, and then its shares traded up. Wow, just like the good old days. Before the IPO market can properly thaw, uh, you'd expect to see the follow-on market start to show signs of life. I think we can say we're seeing some signs of life. All right, who's got next in the IPO market? We will catch you next week. Thanks for tuning in. All of our podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcast. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.